everybody, it's your girl PC in DC, and I am coming to you today from the house of Frederick Douglass. That's what you see behind me. That's Frederick Douglass's house. And I thought this would be an awesome way to kick off the beginning of Black History Month, uh, February 2020. So here we are, I'm currently waiting for the tours to begin. But right now, I thought, you know, I'd take a minute and just show you guys the outside of the house. It is absolutely spectacular. It's a beautiful property. And um, I don't know if you've ever been inside or not, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat. Um, I remember as a kid, my mom used to bring my sisters and I here every single summer. So visiting Frederick Douglass's house was a part of our summer break. And so that's what we always did. So even into adulthood, I still come, I still visit, and uh, I love it. I never get tired of it. And so I wanted to share it with you all today. So um, I'm here waiting for the tours to get started. And uh, let me take you around and show you the perimeter of the property. I love how from the porch of Frederick Douglass's house, you can actually pan over and see all of downtown DC. And then let's see the upper left corner, that tall obelisk, that's the Washington Monument. Spectacular views from this property. Frederick Douglass buys this house in 1877. He's making a pretty big purchase. He buys the home for $6,700. Today, that would be about 1.3 million. So Frederick Douglass is pretty wealthy at this point in time of his life. But remember, Douglass's wealth is contingent upon him working. If Douglass is not working, he's not making money. So while Douglass is living inside of his home, he is holding a couple of different presidential appointed jobs, like U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia, Recorder of Deeds for the District of Columbia, also a bachelor in Haiti. He is speaking throughout the country, so that's generating him some income. And then he also owns a couple of real estate tracts. So She leaves this house in that group. 
That group was in charge of home alone until the 1920s. And this is the pantry, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. people were coming to visit him. Remember, modes of travel was very different back then. Um, you also have the fact that this is a racially segregated country, and so people of color were facing challenges. Also, women were facing challenges. When they trip, you pack a bag or a suitcase, but they carry travel trunks. If you take a moment and look at the trunk closest to us that has that F. Douglas on it, that was his personal travel trunk that he would have used when he was out on the road. If you notice, Douglas's travel trunk has that, which may travel a little bit easier for him while he's traveling. 
Yeah, so remember, Douglas is an African American first and foremost. We think of Douglas as being this prestigious individual, but he would have faced the same challenges that others would have faced when traveling. We do know that Douglas was not just hanging out and accepting those challenges. Douglas was all about raging against the machine, aid, um, agitating, like he said in his, um, that was one of his things, that he was all about agitating against things. We do know that when Douglas was living here, he would often challenge the system. He would buy a first class ticket. He would see if he was able to sit in that first class section, a white only section. A lot of times he was able to, but a lot of times he was not. Intimate part of the home or the, place, the rooms of the people who called this their home. To the left is Anna's room, his first class state. In Anna's room, you will see a large chair over the corner to the left. It is the invalid chair, so it's called a wheelchair. That was that purchase that chair for Anna to make it a little bit easier for her. Now, after Anna's death, Douglas closes Anna's room off in memory. Um, no one ever sees an Anna's room again back in the Victorian era. That's often in homes how they memorialize their loved ones. So 18 months later, when Helen moves into the home, out of respect, she moves next door. And Helen sees you can see a lot of her things, like her typewriter, her sewing machine, her shoes on the floor, wash pan and pitcher, even simply her hairpins on the dresser. Across the hall is Douglas's space, and everything in Douglas's room was his. It does put the weights on the floor. Douglas did like weights every day. <laughs> and was he completely self-educated? Yes, so he receives no formal education. Um, so it has a lot to do with why Douglas is reading quite a bit. Um, even up at this point in time in his life, um, all of those 2,000 books that he owned, he read them. Um, yeah, so he never received any formal education. look at his life full circle from this space. He could sit here and look to the left and see the city grow up in front of him, which was his present and his future. He could also sit here and look out to the right. To the right, the hills that you see is the state of Maryland, where he was born and slave. And then behind me up the steps is an attic area where his grandchildren would enjoy their time here. Um, Douglas was all about giving back to that next generation. Douglas misses out a lot of time with his children. He realized a lot of the reasons why his children were having challenges as adults is because he was not there. And so he really wanted to cultivate that next generation. Most of his grandchildren do go to college um, and they um, become educated individuals. Um, he even has some descendants that are still alive today that do speak out against human trafficking, which will be today like modern day slavery, continue Douglas's legacy. Now, Douglas is inside his home until his death on February the 20th, 1895. Douglas goes to speak in the morning on behalf of the women's suffrage movement. He comes home, has dinner at the dining room table, um, and then he goes into the four-year area and he collapses and has a massive heart attack. He is funeralized here in Washington, D.C. at Metropolitan a &E Church, where he was a member, and then he's funeralized in Rochester, New York, and that is where Douglas is buried. Douglas chooses Rochester because that's where he raises his children to adulthood. And that is also where he buries his youngest daughter, Annie, a little bit before the Civil War, she dies. And so he wants to have a family plot there. And so he's buried there with Annie, and both of his wives are buried there, along with some of his children and grandchildren who decide to be buried in Rochester. Now, as I mentioned, right after Douglas' death, Helen opens up the door so that people can come in and out and visit Douglas's home. She's living here for those seven years. She lived upstairs. People would visit the lower part because levels of intimacy inside of homes from the Victorian era was very different from our ideas today. Um, she's able to maintain the ownership of the home, and she leaves this house to the group, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Historic Association that I talked about. And that group was in charge of the home all the way up until 1962 when the National Park Service comes in. At that point in time, um, the National Park Service had only one other site that was dedicated to an African American, and they had no site that was dedicated to someone that was part of the women's suffrage movement. So you think about what's going on in the 60s, you have a civil rights movement going on, and so you can really see how intentional this house joining the National Park Service was. Um, it took quite a while for some funding to come about to do the first original um, restoration project from 62 to 68. The restoration project took from 68 to 72, and then on February the 14th, 1972, the National Park Service opens up the door so that people can come in and out and visit Douglas's home. 
Um, we have done several other conservation efforts inside of the home to maintain the property so that people can continue to come and hear Douglas Historic as we wish. So thank you for coming past and visiting. Um, I enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, enjoy Black History Month. Today is the first one. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Too. Yeah, it's like every first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. They said they, those belong to him. Oh. That's a pretty small yeah. bed for someone yeah, for over someone six feet. Big. It's yeah. really tiny. Hey guys, I really hope you all enjoyed the tour. I'm going to be honest, I have been here many, many times before and a lot of what I saw there today is different. A lot of the furniture is different, a lot of the decor, uh, the wall treatments, a lot of things are different and I guess that's part of what uh, the preservation team, you know, has to deal with just to make sure the museum can stay open and stay functional. Um, but it was it was good. I learned a lot again, as always, and I hope you all enjoyed the tour of Frederick Douglass's house and heard the uh, the tour guide and giving uh, her spill on some of the history. I hope you all learned a little something with that as well. And what I'll do is I'll catch you in the next vlog. Take care. Bye bye.